Good evening. This is Rosemary Smallcomb. Our first speaker tonight is Gene Potkey, CAL FIRE Southern California Area Liaison. He provides guidance and reviews applications to become FireWise recognized. We have Karen Caldwell, who is the Tuolumne uh, Fire Safe Council FireWise Coordinator. She'll be speaking. Um, also, John Coddington, who is the Horse Gold Resource Conservation District FireWise Coordinator. And we have Adar Imken. Um, Adar is a resident of Yosemite West, and she, along with at least one other person, uh, brought Yosemite West to the status of a FireWise recognized community. So, and Yosemite West is the one community right now in Mariposa County that is FireWise recognized. So we're hoping that we can learn from all these folks that have um, been there, done that, so to speak, and um, bring a lot more of our communities to that status um, in the hopes that we can all reduce wildfire risk. Um, we also have Brian Matos, who is the forester for Madera Mariposa. Say a few words about timber harvest documents, which would, will be important um, for folks who are considering removing trees um, to reduce their fuel loads. And we have Chief uh, Steve Ward trying to scroll on this. Um, get it right. Who is our Mariposa County Fire Chief and Chair of the Mariposa County Fire Advisory Committee. That committee is responsible for implementing the county's wildfire protection plan. And also um, he will be available to guide communities as they develop their community specific wildfire protection plans. And he'll tell you how that will overlap with the firewise recognition um, process. We are uh, recording this meeting so um, we can use it at, on, on our website so that folks who weren't able to attend tonight, either virtually or in person, can go to the website and take a look and um, learn whatever they need to know. Um, and then in January, we're planning to have another meeting in Mariposa Town um, so that folks, again, who aren't able to, to um, attend this meeting but have questions about uh, FireWise recognition will be able to attend that meeting. And um, from there, we'll probably um, be looking at having smaller scale discussions in the different communities that choose to pursue FireWise recognition. So housekeeping details or maybe Zoom keeping details um, so that people avoid talking over one over one another. We're going to ask that folks on that are attending via Zoom raise, use the raise hand function. Um, and we'll we'll have both we've set aside hopefully enough time for questions, but we'll stay as long as you need to answer as many questions as you have about firewise recognition. So with that, I will turn it over to Jean Kotke from Cal Fire. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Supervisor Schwartz. I appreciate it. We could queue up the PowerPoint. And I just wanted to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy day to be here. Um, Hopefully tonight, I'm gonna, what I'm, my goal is to tell you what is FireWise, tell you what the benefits are from it, and then how can you become FireWise? And then I'll stick around for questions and answers afterwards, all right? Okay. Um, my name is Gene Potkin. I'm the town chief with Cal Fire, the Office of State Fire Marshal. And one of my other duties is required is the, to be the Southern California Area Liaison for FireWise, where I can help connect you to our staff, boots on the ground, to help you get through that process of becoming FireWise. But before we can do that, we have to figure out, well, what is it? FireWise is a <laughs> grassroots effort. It's where local community members can get together and take those preparedness and prevention efforts towards wildfire and create what we call an action plan, create steps that you can take as a community to help your community become more resilient against wildfire. Resilient, in other words, the ability to recover quickly, okay? 
And FireWise is administered by the National Fire Protection Association or NFPA. And the NFPA um, administers this program nationwide. And what it is, it's a voluntary program. And I gotta stress that folks, it's a voluntary program. It's a voluntary program. There is no force of rule, okay? It's a voluntary program. And what this does is, count, is uh, FireWise is partnered with CAL FIRE so that we can focus the public's attention towards the prevention and preparedness activities against wildfire through education. From that education base, you now, as your community and members, can speak and act from knowledge as you take these efforts to prepare your community against wildfire. A couple of things I wanted to chime in here about it, it's really important is that it encourages neighbors to work with one another. Quite often, um, due to size, our, our lot sizes, homes can be closer than 100 foot. And we all know, especially living up here in the state responsibility area, you're required to have 100 feet of defensible space. But if your neighbor's home falls within that 100 foot space and you have a property line, the law states that you will clear to your property line or 100 feet, whichever comes first, right? You don't have the, the permission to, to trespass. You can't do that. So it's important for you and your neighbors to work together to get that defensible space clearance because not only does the vegetation feed into the, the water and the fire threat, but also the home, right? So that's where this neighborhood working together is really important. And then the last bullet point there means to decrease the risk for residents and first responders. Essentially, it's your role. It is your individual responsibility to bring the defense. And what I mean by bringing the defense is you're, you're working on your defensive space. You're taking measures to prepare your home against wildfire, what we call home hardening, okay? So that when an event happens and you call, California's fire service is gonna bring the offense. Okay. So FireWise right now is in 42 states, including Hawaii, which is not pictured on the map. Um, this is the FireWise interactive map on their webpage. You can go to their webpage, you can type in an address, and it'll show you that um, if there's uh, an existing uh, FireWise community near you. And if that's the case, you could contact those individuals and see if you can join. And if there isn't one near you, then we're going to talk about those steps and how you can start up a firewise community. There's over 1,500 sites. California currently has over 590 sites. We are leading the nation right now in firewise communities. State of Oregon's right behind us in second place with about half of that. So, why do you, what are the benefits? Why should you participate? As you choose to join, firewise has a step by step process that's gonna focus your efforts and your energy in order to become FireWise. You're gonna learn about wildfire but through your local fire department, your local fire experts, okay? And in doing that, getting that education process, you're gonna get peace of mind that you're actually speaking to the experts and now taking those steps to prepare your community against wildfire, right? And ultimately, you're looking to protect your family and your home and then your community at large. So then as you start this working together, this community building, this is where the beauty of the program comes in. In that as neighbors are working with neighbors up and down the street, if something should happen and a neighbor's incapacitated, they can't get out there and do the clearance work that they need or the home hardening work that they need. Communities up and down the state have actually set aside a day of the month where they'll get community members together and they'll go to that individual's house and put in an hour's worth of work. Well, if you have eight to 10 people putting in an hour's worth of work on one house, that's eight to 10 hours of work. A lot can get done. So then as the community builds, pride's big. It's hard work, right? But we understand that when a job's done well and it's been hard, that community pride builds. So, Access to funding and assistance. We know that there is a far more requests than there are funds available that comes through grants, whether provided by the state or, or the federal government, okay? So if we have equal 
grant petitions are equally worthy. The folks that award grants sometimes will lean towards those communities that are already firewalls because they have established and demonstrated that they're already focused in that direction of preparedness and prevention against wildfire. So this would be a good avenue to award those limited funds. Make sense? And then the USA a discounts in certain states, um, in California, this insurance company in particular is offering this insurance discounts for their members for being recognized as firefighters. If you were to go to, if you are, were to go to the California Department of Insurance website, Commissioner Laura, the, the insurance commissioner, has posted there a list of insurance companies that would provide a discount for being recognized as firefighters. So, uh, steps to we went into present. Yeah, okay. I was getting that on my screen, not that on yours. I was trying to admit somebody who's in the waiting room. Oh, okay. Well, no worries. We'll uh, we'll keep trucking on here. So, how are you going to get started? Well, in, in order to become firewise, one of the first things you need is you need a minimum of eight dwelling units in your community, no more than twenty five hundred. All right. So, once we can check that box, yes, we move on to getting a risk assessment. All right, and the risk assessment is a template form that can be found on the FireWise website. And it's a, it is a step-by-step -step process. It walks you through. You just, you enter in basic information about your communities, how many homes, how many people live in your community, where is it located, what is the vegetation around you like, do you have past fire history? And then you would, and then you would, um, Okay, then you would um, survey your your community with your local fire uh, experts, and you're looking at the homes. How many of the homes in this community have a Class A roof? How many of these homes in the community have the zero to five foot defensible space, the, the six to 30 foot defensible space, and the 31 to 100 feet? There's a survey that you that will be conducted, and from that information, you're going to have a summary of what work needs to get done. Where were you deficient? Okay, and then so so we've done the risk assessment, and that that's the risk assessment. The next thing you need to do is you need to get you need to form a committee. There's a lot of work that needs to get done. So if you can form three or four, or six panel members on, on your community. That's going to be great, okay? And then, because that's those folks are going to, have to be their cheerleaders for the group, right? They're the ones that are going to be canvassing the neighborhood and communicating to the rest of your neighbors. We're trying to become firewise. This is what it's about. Come to the meeting, okay? You're once, as I said, from the risk assessment, you're going to have that summary of actions that you need to do. You need to create a three-year action plan, and that three-year action plan is going to have measurable goals of what our community, your community is going to do every year. And California has a very specific three-year action plan template. It can be found on the NFPA's website. It also can be found on our website, the readyforwildfire.org, and that'll display up here at the end. But the risk assessment looks at four categories. And what we're looking at is outreach and education. You are required as a community to have one outreach event every year. That simply could be coffee and donuts. Let's have the local forester come in and talk about tree help. Let's have the local fire department come in and talk about defensible space, home hardening. It could be someone from the local nursery that could come in and talk about wildfire resistant landscape. It's, it's your plan that you're coming up with. But that's, that's outreach and education. And fuel reduction is another part of that. What do you, defensible space around the homes? Are there common areas that maybe the community can get together in and, and do some weed whacking? Okay, for an example, just an example. Um, and then the home hardening, that part, maybe we want to set goals to, let's exchange some of those event streams, all right? Maybe uh, we'll, we'll do it, have a do-it-yourself weekend where somebody will demonstrate what can be done at their house and then the rest of the community can go out and retrofit their home, low-cost retrofits. 
And then finally, evacuation planning and then other wildfire preparedness measures. Evacuation planning we're finding is very critical. And these past fires that we've had over the last few years, we've uh, unfortunately just had a lot of folks that were that lost their life in the evacuation stage. So evacuation plan, how are we gonna do it? Where are we gonna do, go? What kind of bags are we gonna have packed? What about medication, food for your animals, things like that. So I talked about how you have to have a minimum of one uh, wildfire risk reduction education outreach event, that's annually. And then you have to meet the minimum wildfire risk reduction investment. So what that means is that for every home in your community, if you had 100 homes, every home annually has to invest one hour of uh, fire preparedness and pre uh, prevention measures. I think most of you are probably doing that on a weekend as summer comes up and you're out there with the weed whacker, right? It's pretty low bar, right? So and pretty easy to make. Well, each one of those hours is equivalent to a volunteer a dollar worth of $28.54. So then your community, if you had 100 homes, is going to be responsible for $2,854 of risk investment work. That's one hour. If you have a landscaper coming to your house, that dollar amount counts. But you see why you need to have all of these um, community leaders, because somebody's got to take that, take that information in, right? And they, and they have to be reporting that to the board. And then the last thing there that shows is you've got to create a Firewise USA portal account to submit your application. And again, once you create that account, there's a step-by-step -step process to walk you through on building a community profile. Okay. Let's see, now all of this. Now, so this is just a snapshot of what the portal looks like. I mentioned how it's a step-by-step -step process walking you through this dollar amount here in the, the zeros you see in the bottom right hand corner that's where it would tell you that based on your the size of your community this is the target goal you have to reach for your community investments okay so if you want to find out more information nfpa's website at the top there's where you want to go you can do a simple google search how to become firewise usa and then you want to go to the NFPA website where they will give you basically a step-by-step -step process and how to become firewise. You can also go to readyforwildfire.org. Cal Fire has similar information there as well. And then finally, um, this is a little too small for you to see here, but hopefully the folks at home can see it. The state is broken up into service areas where um, we have a designated individual that can help get you through that process of becoming firewise. So in this case, it's Fire Captain Kyle O'Neill, who's in the back of the room. Um, don't ask me questions today. This is like his first week in the job. So you go train him. <laughs> but, but no worries. He and I and his supervisor will be attached at the head at to help get you through. All right. Well, folks, um, that's all I have for you. Question? How does this relate to the Fire Safe Council? Fire Safe Council. So, what happens with fire safe councils is the nice thing about that is fire safe councils tend to be a recipient of grant funding. So now you have a firewise community that's within that council and now can have that discussion with them that, hey, we're, we have these projects. Can you help us out? It creates that, that relationship. And like I mentioned earlier, that now that you recognize firewise community, right? If you had two competing requests, one community is not firewise and the other is, then you know the one that's demonstrating that hey, we're taking this seriously could potentially get the, the award. Thank you, Gene. We have, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, two folks who are representing resource, I'm sorry, resource conservation districts in other counties. Um, and as part of the Mariposa County Fire Advisory Committee, um, some two of those members, one is um, our own Mariposa County uh, Fire Safe Council, and the uh, second is the Mariposa County Resource Conservation District. So we're already coordinating um, and talking to one another, and we'll be available to help um, any community that wants to pursue 
uh, FireWise recognition. I'm sorry, there was a question. I'm, I'm taking five minutes worth of questions of clarification, and then we'll have more general conversation later. Um, Shannon, you had a question? Yeah, a question for the gentleman there. So you want to use the microphone? So now I have a projecting voice. <laughs> well, the people on Zoom probably can oh, have So that's why we have two microphones up here. Sure. My question is uh, you were referring to having a firewise community. Is there a percentage of, you used an example of 100 homes? Is So let's just say, for sake of argument, we have 100 homes here. In, the Greeley Hill area, do we have to have all 100 homes or is there a percentage or how, how does that actually break down in order to get to the, the recognition as a firewise community? Sure. Once you have designated your one, one of the requirements you have to do is you have to draw a boundary around the community that is seeking recognition. Okay. So if it's 100 homes, then that's what it is. That's where that number is based off of the, the annual risk investment hours, okay? Inevitably, you're not gonna have everybody that's gonna wanna participate. Right. That's why you only have to do one hour per home. Pretty low bar, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure most of you are probably spending a couple, three hours, if not on a weekend, just weed whacking around the house. So that's where that, that, uh, that's made up. So it's, a, it's the hours, ratio with the homes type of well let me clarify i think it's a voluntary program so if you've got 120 homes and 100 folks say we're on board we're going to pursue this those are the 100 homes the 20 that are saying man count me out they're not part of that firewise community and, and that's where yeah definitely something you, you, you want to have that talk as you're going around with those neighbors right because um if if you did it with the with the folks that participate, that's fine. But what if next year those folks that didn't, they start to see your efforts, they start to hear what's going on, and they say, "Hey, I want to join." And now you have twenty homes that are joining. Well, you got to go back and do a risk assessment because now you're changing the dynamics of the community based on the homes. Okay, and it might change your three year action plan. But for sure, if you're adding, you're going to be doing a new risk assessment. That document is updated every five years. Three-year three action plan is updated every three years. Three-year action plan. So, what if the opposite happens? What if people sign up for it originally and then fall out? Can other people make up those hours? Yes, absolutely. It, it's not so much that because we have 100 homes, there has to be an hour assigned it from every address. It's just that community as a whole is responsible for those 100 hours. Okay, it sounds like we've got questions about how do I actually make this work? So um, that's why we have folks who've actually been working on fire rec firewise recognition status in other communities. And our first speaker up is Karen Caldwell. Oh, I'm next. You're next. <laughs> <laughs> And I, how many communities do you have now? And we only have 16. Only 16. So we have four that are very close. That is about three. Okay. Well, Karen, you're up. And please tell us about your experience in bringing Firewise communities. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you, Jean. Can I share the screen? Yes, please. And I apologize for the earlier confusion people were going to get in. I'm a Zoom administrator, and I'm also the host of the meeting, and uh, those two seem to be in conflict. So I don't know what will happen this time, but we'll find out. Best of luck, Karen. <laughs> um, I, 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 a couple things I heard um, in the first presentation. Um, I mean, I'm actually uh, working in Tuolumne County, so things are going to be different from county to county. From group to group, uh, even even individual neighborhood to neighborhood. So there, every there's a lot of variety in here, and so it's not always concrete answers. But uh, we generally figure them out. So are, can you blow up the screen? Well, I'm, I'm well, most the screen, I mean, most fall out. They were there, but they're gone. I don't know. I'm asking. It, yeah, we lost closed captions when when it went to the small screen. 
Well, let me see if I can reverse. There it is. Okay, right. that'll work. That's better, actually, but I will have to advance it, but I can do that. All right, so I'm a part of the Tuolumne Fire Safe um, Council. Um, my background is I had th 36 years with the U.S. Forest Service. I was a district ranger up on the, up at Pinecrest. Uh, you know where Pinecrest is, I'm 120. Um, when I retired, I went to the Tuolumne Fire Safe Council, and um, I'm a volunteer, and I'm on the board of directors. And um, I also volunteered to take on the role as the Firewise Coordinator in Tuolumne County. And I'll talk a little more about that. That's um, um, my, the Gmail we set up for Firewise that I monitor. And then um, our Tuolumne Fire Safe uh, Organization um, website has a, a tab on it that's all Firewise. So there's a lot of information in there if you ever want to go in and look. Um, it's a general information of some of it, but some of it might be more specific. Okay, in the beginning, for us in uh, Tuolumne County, 2019 is when we uh, set up our first community. And uh, the, the individual that, that pioneered that, um, I don't know how he actually found out about it first, but he did. And uh, he actually talk, uh, gave a call to the Fire Safe Council and asked for somebody to come help him. So I was assigned that task and off I went to the meeting. And um, one of the things we really came up with out of that, and it was a great meeting and they, they were gung-ho and um, they were kind of a, the planning group that was gonna get started. But we real quickly identified at the fire safe council level and the county level that we really needed a coordinator. Um, we needed somebody for people to call if they had a question, who do you go to? Um, and so our Fire Safe Council Board um, uh, had a member volunteer to, to be that contact that liaison person, and that, that's me, and I'm still doing that since 2019. Okay, um, and of course, one of the first big challenges we had was this whole discussion about is it bottom up or is it top down? Depends on how you look at it. But um, the Firewise program is intended to be bottom up. And it really has to come from the people. It can't come from somebody above you saying, you need to form a firewise community. The people, residents have to want to do it. And it's only going to be successful if you want it to be successful. It can be mediocre, it can be really going, or it can be just kind of passively moving along. But it's as much energy as you want to put into it. So all we're going to do is provide you with a framework to help set that up. And maybe sometimes I might come in and help get people riled up and juiced up again so they can get excited. But um, it really is about what you want to do to help reduce the risk of fire if and when it comes through your neighborhood. It's that simple. So um, for us, we spent some time working with the county and the fire safe council together and talked about, well, what exactly is our role? The county felt like they should have some role in this as well. And, um, and then the Fire Safe Council um, also felt that it was a good fit under the Fire Safe Council. So in the end, we all agreed that we did need a coordinator and we decided to stay with the volunteer coordinator um, under the Fire Safe Council. And so basically what I'm doing as coordinator is the point, I'm the point of contact. I track um, all the different um, things going on, who's in motion, who's not. Um, a lot of the recruiting and outreach, staffing the booths, going to events, that kind of stuff, to, or even going to various meeting with neighborhoods uh, that want to just have a meeting and get interest going in their neighborhood. I go do all those, those kind of things. Uh, startup support, I provide support and help walk people through the process. We maintain the website, um, and I continue to uh, support those communities after they're formed. And I help them with the grant funding. And we have the Fire Safe Council. You asked about the role of the Fire Safe Council. The thing is, when you become a firewise community, you don't become a nonprofit organization unless you want to. But that generally takes a lawyer and some money. And so most people don't want to form a nonprofit organization. Um, you might have a homeowners association that is a nonprofit, but you, most of them aren't. So anyway, because you're not a nonprofit, you're not going to qualify for most grants. There's very few grants. You have to be a nonprofit. And so the Fire Safe Council serves as that nonprofit that will go after that grant. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk, I'll talk about that a little bit later when I tell you how, what we got this year. Okay. Um, the county 
um, the, what the county is doing is they're also doing outreach and recruitment and they're referring um, people that are interested, they refer them so that they channel through me so I can track them so that we keep everything um, going through one place. So they do outreach and recruitment as well. They also um, have their website and they have a section on Firewise and it's also linked to ours. So we're, we're trying to stay seamless. They actually just this year developed an interactive map of all the Firewise communities in the county. And you can go into this map and you can um, see where one is and you can click on it and it'll pop up and tell you who it is and who their leader is. You could contact to get more information and you can see how they're situated throughout the community. And that's pretty cool. That just happened this year. So we're kind of excited about that. So that links now on both of our websites. Um, they do, um, in 2020, they actually got a grant through the CAL FIRE program. And um, that grant was specifically to help um, get the Firewise program going and support Firewise uh, program in the county. And through that grant, um, by working together, um, we were they they purchased a lot of uh, supplies and materials, and I'll show you some examples of that that I'm still using and we're still using um, together. And um, I feel really lucky because I have all this cool stuff. Um, and so this is basically some of that cool stuff. <laughs> we got the canopy and the tablecloth and the tables and the chairs and the and the stands and the brochures and all that kind of stuff that you get um, when you want to go out and go to the shows and 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 recruit for firewise. So that was kind of cool. Um, we also got this sign, which is kind of neat. We, these are the big um, A-frame billboards. So if somebody's doing a project out in their community, they can put that up on one on each end of their project. And so when people are driving through, they can see that, hey, this is a firewise community going on. So it works as a kind of an outreach to uh, get other people interested in the program. And this is just one we use it's an A-frame type thing too that we use during shows or events that we go to. Um, and that's just one of those big flaggy things that are kind of cool. They wave in the wind. These are yard signs that we had developed. They just go out like you get uh, kind of like the election signs out there, you know, just the little metal stakes that you stick in the ground. And what we do is when somebody's starting to organize and uh, they're recruiting even their neighbors and whatnot, we give them a bunch of these and they put them out in their lawns or along their roads so that as there is kind of this whole recruitment going on as you're trying to recruit your neighbors to form up a firewise community. So it's a way of, just one way of communicating and getting the attention of your neighbors. Um, so there's been a bit of a learning curve. Um, I'm not sure if we're ever gonna get past this one. Um, it was pretty tangled and, and you know, hard to figure it out at first, but uh, we're getting there. We're, it gets there all the time, but there's always something different because you know, there's new things every time, new challenges. So one of the big lessons we learned, or I learned at least, was big is not always better. Now, what I mean by this is um, there was a tendency to want to create these large communities, like just a whole subdivision. We're gonna get the whole subdivision in, in it. And so that could be, you know, two, 300 homes or more or whatever, I think, even a hundred is a lot. And um, so we have a couple of those. Our very first one was a huge area. And, um, and they really were not even contiguous in part of it, they, but they just took a lot of roads and they made a big old boundary. Well, within that boundary, they probably only had um, a small percentage that actually signed up to actually be a firewise community. And then they, were, they went ahead and organized and did all this. and. Um, half the people in that boundary didn't even know it existed. So it was kind of, um, that wasn't so good. Um, the other thing that's happening when we go too big is you don't, it's really hard to get a sense of community and neighborhood. Um, you know, you don't see anybody on way on this side or that side. You might, if it's a smaller area, you get to know your neighbors. You, you know, you know the faces, you get to know your neighbors and you work together and do stuff. The further you get, the bigger you get, the harder it is to have that sense of small town community, that camaraderie that you get working on projects together. So there's, there's that, but it works for some. Um, some HOAs, um, homeowner associations, uh, you know, um, Two, two cautions on homeowner associations. One, it can feel like it's top down. And there's some, 
you know, I don't know, maybe you know some people that have HOAs, but they're not always real popular. Um, so it kind of, if it's coming from an HOA, it can't be, you can't get a lot of resistance from people because they, they, their fear is, or their thinking is, is that they're going to come down and give them a lot of new ordinances or whatever it is you, they do, rules <laughs> from the top down. So HOAs are not always, it depends on the community and, and how active and good the HOA, the relationship they have with the neighbors. So sometimes they work and sometimes it's better not to do it under the HOA. Sometimes it's better just to let it be a group of neighbors come up and do it. So here's a couple examples of um, two things here. Um, one of the things the county provides, I think I forgot to highlight that, is they provide free GIS maps. As far uh, When you do your application, you have to attach a map. And it was referred to earlier that you have to define a boundary. So that purple line is the boundary, and then these are the lots within that. Not every single lot is you know joined, signed up, wanted to do it. So um, there is no magic number. Somebody, I think you were asking about that. There's no percentage. There's no magic number. You have to have a minimum of eight. So realistically, you're saying this is a logical boundary to think of in terms of a, of a fire, where you might want to look to see if you can make more continuity between your neighbors. So if you think about it, you think about your home. It's like an isolated island. So you got an island here that's all cleaned out real nice, and then right there's one next door that's not. There's one next door that is, and maybe two that are. So you have these little islands. We want to, what we want to do is get continuity in a bigger swath of area so that your community, your street, your neighbors that are aligned together, you actually become your own fuel break. You're not relying on a fuel break outside. We, the Fire Safe Council and, and the Forest Service or whatever, we're doing all kinds of fuel breaks around the wooies. You all know what a wooey is? Wildland Urban Interface. So uh, fire people, we all call, talk about the wooies. And you're all living in a wooey. <laughs> so that's basically where the people are living in the wooey. So most of the fuel breaks are around the outside, outside of your wooey, separating you from undeveloped lands, you know, that are burning. But what we want to do is we want to work inside the wooey. So now we want to create more defensible space inside your community. So that's what we're really trying to do here. And we have to do that. We residents have to do that. We can't rely on, on other agencies to come and do that for us. So anyway, here's a typical example of GIS map that they make that we that you submit in with your application. I put this in, I talked about this, this thing scrolling. Oh, you're scrolling it, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And not too many. There are tips. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So anyway, all I want to show you about this is this is a group, this is a place called Twain Heart. And has a lot to there's a lot of similarities with Paradise. So, you know, kind of scary place. So um, in this, instead of originally they thought about this whole service district area, but we broke it down. We're starting neighbor neighbors are coming forward and they're creating these smaller little firewise communities. So there's like five of them right in here in Twain Heart. You see they're starting to connect. So, and also they may want to merge down the road. You know, they can merge later on if they want to, but they all went small. And so those are the types of things we're talking about. And then last, I think uh, there's often confusion around the risk assessment versus uh, public code 4291, which is the, the California Cal Fire requirements around the defensible space, the five feet, 30 feet, 100 foot stuff. Uh, the risk assessment is not about doing inspections, 4291 inspections on your home. That's not the, the role of a firewise community. You might be helping each other to do some of that work, especially maybe some of the elderly or some of the, somebody that you know had a heart attack and needs some special help. You might as a community wanna help those individuals. Um, but you're still responsible to do your clearance. But there's a lot of other stuff you want to do as a community, like, you know, um, you might be working on the roadside clearing and all kinds of stuff like that. So anyway, there's some clarity that's needed in that. We're meeting now annually. We have a meeting of the leaders of each of the firewise communities. We come together each year. 
we talk about who did what, who did, how much did it cost to get rid of chip or how much blah, blah, blah. Then they all share um, ideas and thoughts and it really is a positive thing and they really like doing it. So, and they're actually looking at even, um, one, what came out of this that was really exciting is they formed a small group to look at fundraising opportunities because things cost money. Oh, this is an example of the track. You don't need to see that. Just some people doing wonderful things. Um, before and after. Um, so that small group decided, um, saw this opportunity to get a grant through the California Fire Foundation grant. You could go up to $15,000 um, and it was open to fire life com um, communities. So that group approached the Fire Safe Council. Together we worked on putting together an application. We were successful. We got $10,000 um, for fire life communities um, to implement things on their action plans. Um, so it was actually to reduce fuel. So what we did is we made little mini grants. If you take 16, we had 16, we divided that into the 10,000, but you came into about $550 each. Uh, you can rent a chip or a dumpster and stuff. It was start, it was there, so we're excited. And then the last thing that happened for us, which was good, was the Board of Supervisors uh, provided some funding this year to the Fire State um, Council for support to our Firewise communities. So that's it. You turned it off, I get it. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate all that great information. What I'd like to do is move on to the other folks who have um, been involved in making communities firewise recognized. And then we can we'll have a general sort of conversation and take all your questions about. Um, how do we make this work here in the Mariposa County communities? So with that, I'll turn it over to John Coddington. And again, John is the um, FireWise coordinator for the Course Gold Resource Conservation District. So take it away, John. Thank you, Supervisor Smallcorn. Hi, everybody. Nice to see everybody. So I am the program manager for Course Gold Resource Conservation District and the regional FireWise coordinator from there. Um, so, as Karen mentioned, we all kind of work on things a little differently. Um, for ourselves, we were able to get some funding through the county in 2019 to actually create a staff position. So, at that time, I had been on the board of directors for the RCD, and it was a volunteer position. <clears throat> in 2021, I stepped off the board and uh, took on the position of FireWise coordinator. I've been doing that for about a, just about a year. So, we received implementation funds, as well as staffing money from our county to go ahead and get the Firewise program going. We also recently wrote a grant for right around a million dollars. It's not all for the Firewise program, but a good portion of it is. And so we actually supply a little bit of funding for each of our certified communities, somewhere in the neighborhood of about five to $7,000 and a few chipping days a year. We also have a, um, a, a tool cache that is available to any of the communities when they're doing their community projects. So we can bring that out to them. We have a truck and trailer that we're in the process of purchasing that'll get that out to folks. So what I wanted to talk about tonight is the fact that a lot of this probably kind of to some mountain folks, I've lived up here in North Fork for 30 years. So I'm in County, been up here a long time. And all the work that we do already covers all this firewise work. To some of us, it kind of seems silly while we're going to put the extra effort into all through the paperwork just to get this going. But because FireWise isn't just about the weed eating or the tree trimming and keeping your six feet, it's about the home parking as well. And so even though all of us think that we have a, a good handle on what we have on our properties, myself included, once I stepped in this position, I just realized there was so much more that I could be doing. Um, you know, I had a lot of beautiful vegetation that I kept all over the home, and it was just extremely too close to the home. I had fences that attached to the home that were flammable. I had vents that were not... So you're supposed to have uh, a minimum of eighth inch or, or a maximum of quarter inch, a minimum of eighth inch screen. So you want to have eighth inch screen around your vents in order to not have wind driven embers in a wind then an incident uh, come in and be exposed to your foundation vents or your attic vents, things of that nature. Majority of our homes, especially in these areas, are older homes. And so all those vents are quarter inch usually. And so there's a lot of retrofitting that we have to do. You know, a lot of wooden decks that we still have that are definitely a concern lattice around our homes or skirting around our homes because our homes are built off camber because we live on hillsides so if we have decks that are attached to the home and have grass and things of that nature coming right up to the house these are all flammable situations that we 
probably look over sometimes just because we've been doing it for so long. You know, I've been burning piles myself and think I have a handle on it, but then you look and there's another tree down next winter. And so all these things we just have to keep up on. And so that's really the important part is us getting back together as neighbors and really wanting to work together. Because you know, when I was a kid growing up, we used to all get together on my road and, and patch holes in the, in the asphalt or fix trees that fell down in the wintertime. And as folks moved away and folks retired and got old and passed away, things of that nature, all that's kind of gone by the wayside. We don't really don't even know all of our neighbors anymore. And you know, I was evacuated in the Creek Fire and the Fork Fire recently. Well, and to have phone numbers of my neighbors and to know them and to know that who was going to take care of things and who was going to be on site still to watch over the homes and all these things really mattered. And when you have a firewise community, it really helps you just collaborate with your neighbors to bring that together. So I know it does sound silly to sit there and have to work on a community day when you're just going to burn yourself anyways, or you're going to trim that tree anyways, but your retired neighbor may not be able to do that. And if your neighbor doesn't have that same fire protection and it's sitting right next to your property, you're going to burn too, regardless of what you've done. So if we can collaborate and work together on these homes that are not being addressed, it really helps us in the big picture of being fire safe in our communities. Um, we all have a lot of similar issues as well that I've noticed in the mountain communities. Um, in Madera County, we have a lot of one way in, one way out type of roads. And so we have a lot of concern with emergency access. With our FireWise program, we like to help folks focus on the emergency access as well as the defensible space around their house. Even driveways, things of that nature, because if Cal Fire can't access your home, they're not going to save it. And if you can't get out, you can't get, you know, you can't save yourself. So by collaborating together with these FireWise programs, it really helps us look at all angles, the evacuation, the home hardening, the defensible space, and just the sense of community of all of us getting together and making sure we make it out of these catastrophic events. Because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, because these hills are supposed to burn. It's just a matter of making sure that we have lessened the fuel load so when they do burn through, it burns through in a safe, healthy manner. Um, all I can say is that it's really helping folks in Madera County become educated on things that, like I said, they thought they already knew, but you know, there's there's expansion of what we know. And so if we can get together and get these firewise communities going, we can reach out for these larger grants because you know, a few hundred dollars here, or there, even the pot funding that I have, the five thousand dollars per community, isn't enough to do a large scale clearing. But like Gene uh, mentioned earlier, it, it checks a box on these grant things. And so if you have a firewise community collaborating. You come to your fire safety council, your RCD, and you have an idea of what to do in the community. It's much easier than if random homeowners just come to us and say, I need help with my problems. But if we have a firewise community together, we can create those larger scale projects that are really going to save us in the event of a catastrophic wildfire. And um, really, that's what I was here to talk about more than anything. It's just we're all we're all trying and we're all here together and we as mountain folks, we can't just continue to be the one little island. You know, I have 16 acres in North Fork. I don't have to look at my neighbors ever if I don't want to. But in the event of a wildfire, it's really good to have phone numbers and have connections and have us all work together. And so if we create these communities, it's one step in the uh, right direction to uh, make us all safe. So thank you guys. And I'll answer any questions later on down the road as we move on and things. So thank you. Thank you very much, John. And it really is all about community um, working all together with our community wildfire protection plan and the firewise communities partnering to reduce the fuel loads. So, Steve, are we ready to bring Adar? I think so. Adar Imkin, as I mentioned earlier, is um, the firewise coordinator in Yosemite West. The only community. Ta da! There she is. <laughs> Technology is great when it works. Adar um, and Katie Weber, I think, were the um, the leaders of the Firewise community recognition in Yosemite West. And um, since they're the only one we have, we really wanted to hear from them. So, Adar, please take it away. Yes. Hi. So, my name is Adar Emkin, and I'm representing Yosemite West. Um, and before I start, I want to point out that um, I am a scientist and an educator. I am not a fire professional. And so for people who are considering doing FireWise, keep in mind, you don't have to know anything about fire when you start this process. You can just be someone in your community who's concerned and wants to help. So don't worry about all these fire terms people are throwing around. As you go through the process, you're going to learn a lot, but you can just start as an interested person. Um, and so I thought 
probably what would be best is if I kind of go through the process again. I know Jean went through it, but kind of my experience with it and and maybe the the things that were challenging for me. Um, so the way I started was we organized a committee first. So it was Katie Weber and myself, and we just kind of tried to figure out who we knew in the community who might be interested or have knowledge about fire in the community and people in the surrounding area, you know, people like Fire Safe Council or research conservation districts. Um, so we found people, we formed a committee. So I knew who my support people were through the process. And then we had to define the neighborhood. With Yosemite West, it was, it's pretty clear because we are sort of an island of homes um, inside Yosemite National Park. So we just made all of Yosemite West our community. Um, the community has to be between eight and 2,500 dwelling units. I think we're about 150. And as some people pointed out, even though we have we are one big community and we are all doing this together, there are certainly people within the community who uh, don't really actively contribute to the Firewise process, but that we still include them in our numbers. We try to help them. Um, once you draw the lines, everyone inside the lines is part of your community and you're gonna work, uh, they're gonna be part of your risk assessment, they're gonna be part of your action plan and you're gonna try to get them to come in and be more an active part later on. So after we defined the neighborhood, um, we did the risk assessment. And so there is a template online for the risk assessment, but you're gonna need professional help with that. So actually CAL FIRE came out and spent the day with me going through the community. There are a lot of questions on there, things about what kind of roofing places have, things like that, things that I could not answer. Um, so they took a lot of time. We walked to the whole community. They helped me answer those questions as well as just pointing out things that we needed to work on. So things like a lot of people had things underneath their porch, flammable materials underneath their porch, branches overhanging chimneys, uncovered wood piles, you know, just all of these little things that I wouldn't have noticed, but they walked through and said, this is an issue, this is an issue. Um, and so after that, I was able to write the risk assessment. And so you follow the template, you write the risk assessment, and that's pretty clear. The harder part is the next step is the action plan. So you take that risk assessment and now you should know what are the problems in your community. And some of them are really simple, you know, covering wood piles, that's low hanging fruit. Some of them like reinforcing the evacuation route are much more complex. So you're gonna have to sit down and come up with an action plan. And um, at the time that I did it, there was not actually a template. There is now, which is very helpful. Um, so you're going to have to figure out how are you going to address those issues. And actually, the first time that I submitted my action plan, it got rejected. <laughs> so because I was not specific enough, I said what I wanted to do, but I didn't say how I was going to do it. So if you're going to say something like we're going to try to remove biomass, you know, X number of uh, amount of biomass, you can't just say that. You have to say, how are you actually going to achieve that? So you, the action plan takes a while because you're trying to establish, you're trying to lay out what you want to do and exactly how you are going to get there. And that's a three-year plan that you have to do every three years. So once I had an action plan that was good, I submitted it um, on the website. So you have to create an account and apply through the website. It's actually pretty straightforward. And then after that, you have to show your annual fire prevention activities. And so that's that one hour or the monetary equivalent per dwelling unit per year. Um, so it's actually a, a very low bar. You know, so if we have 150 dwellings in our community, that's 150 hours. That's not hard. I mean, most, a lot of people spend several hours you know, on their home or several thousand dollars doing fire prevention things around their home. So it's not hard at all to meet that that requirement. And there's also a education, one education or outreach a year. And again, it doesn't have to be anything big. It can just be a community meeting where you talk about fire. You have someone speak about insurance like we did. You, you have someone come out and do a talk or you do some informational session. You can even, I think we've sent out flyers. It's just, it's just trying to get the conversation going in your community and making fire something that people are thinking about every year, especially during fire season. Um, so the strengths, the reason I, I like Firewise is it gives you a, a framework in which to do the community outreach. So I'm kind of, I like to talk to my neighbors. I like them, but I'm certainly not going to go up to them and say, hey, you know, I, I saw you cleaned pine needles out of your gutters. How long did that take you? And how much, if someone else did it, how much did it cost? You know, that would be rather awkward. Um, so this gives you a reason to do outreach, kind of a framework in which to do it. So it gives you a reason to ask these questions of your neighbors. 
And because you were designing the action plan, you are tailoring it to your community. You're really, you, you're trying to understand what your community needs to do and then find a way to do that. So I really like it because it gives you this framework, gives you a reason to organize and talk to people in your community. You tailor it to your specific community and your goals. Um, as far as the challenges go, um, it's not, it's not difficult, the whole process, but you can imagine it is somewhat time consuming and it takes effort. So for whoever is involved in the process, this is not something you're just gonna sit down on a weekend and become firewise. You know, this is gonna be a process that you go through of doing the risk assessment, doing the action plan, recruiting, you know, trying to figure out how many hours people have done in the community. It's gonna, it will take effort for whoever does it, but it's, it's not hard, anyone can do it. It's just you have to be devoted to you're, you're going to go through this process. Um, and the other thing that has been a little bit of a challenge is getting people to report their hours or the amount of money that they have spent doing fire prevention. Um, not because they don't want to, it's just if they don't see me, how are they going to tell me if I don't think to ask them? And so um, the first year, last year, we did a paper form and we did a paper mailing to everyone or put it in their mailbox so that they would fill out this form and returned it to me. Um, this year we did something that actually worked better. We did an online form. So I created a Google form that asked for all the information that I need for the Firewise renewal. And um, I would just ping people every once in a while after the community picnic or things like that and say, hey, here's the link to the form. I really need people to go do this. Um, and like I said, not everybody participates, but people, people do, they are doing this work anyway. And so, they just have to every once in a while click that link and let me know about it so that I know it for the renewal. And now that I think they've gotten a bit used to it, I think in, in future years moving forward, it will be a little easier because I will send them the link. They will know, oh, it's Firewise time, time to report my hours. And um, it, yeah, so and at the community outreach events, we've been really good about trying to communicate what our action plan is and what the steps we're trying to take are and what our goals are each year so that we're kind of united as a community and what we're trying to achieve. So. So yeah, so this is, I mean, this is our second year doing Firewise. We, last year we became Firewise, the first Firewise community in Mariposa County. And hopefully we continue and we're happy to try to help other people go through this process because like I said, it's not hard, but it takes some time. And if you're like me at the start, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> um, so uh, definitely now I've, I've learned a lot about fire through the process and I'm happy to help anyone else uh, get through the process as well. Great, thank you so much, Adar. Um, so I'd like to open it up now for questions about the how-to. Um, hopefully you're thinking about how you might make this work in your community um, or communities. And so do you have specific questions for Karen or John or Adar? I have a question. Okay. So in... Obviously, in our area up here, we have a really a preponderance of elderly folks that don't have the physical capability of doing this. And I like the idea of getting other folks in, in kind of forming committees or whatever you want to call those to, to help do that. We do that kind of on a, on a scale already here, uh, just on our own. But my question is, is, do you guys have some type of a publication or a pamphlet or a little brochure or something, because I'm I'm going through in my mind here of going around to each individual home, you know, in district, you know, to here to talk to each one of these people and having to give this uh, explanation of what this is, it would be much easier is that if you could just hand them something that they could read really quickly. And if you have that, could I see it? Yeah. I have some with us. We both have some with us. I've got some. They're right there if you want to pass them around. So what we have, what we have, we created a publication right there on the table. Okay, so Karen and John have brought hard copies. Um, Just for that purpose. Okay, you. do you have um, copies on your website for folks that are tuning in via Zoom? No. Okay, all right. We have copies of this pamphlet on our website, and we have other Firewise related information and links back to the, the NFPA website as well, so. Okay, well, like I said, we're recording this and uh, my plan is to post this on the county website, so we will scan in the images from these um, handouts, but if you could uh, pass them out here to sure. the folks that who are well, here in person. 
what John had is, is the one that's put out by NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, which is a national sponsor. And then what I have is what we, we custom made for oh, Tuolumne sorry. County. Yeah. So what I have is what we custom made for Tuolumne County. Um, uh, so that's a little bit different than what John here had, the, uh, the national one. Well, you guys are here to, uh, along yeah. with Adar, to um, provide ideas. So welcome um, to whatever you have brought with you. I'm sure folks would appreciate um, being able to see and take a look at. Okay, no. okay let me. Can I just, um, Adar, are you still on? Do you have uh, any? I am here. Anything from the Yosemite West side? Um, no, I, so I don't. I didn't pass anything out. We just kind of did it and sent emails. We have an email distribution list. I um, mean, I have to say, a lot of people don't read emails. What they did notice is once we became Firewise, some people got discounts on their insurance and suddenly people were knew we were a Firewise community and were much more interested when they started seeing that. And so we that generated a lot of interest. When we started, I just kind of started with the handful of people who I knew were really devoted to fire prevention in the community, started with them, started doing the process, and then reached out and said, okay, everybody, we're doing this process. You know, there was a community picnic, said everybody, we're doing this process. I'm going to need this information from you. And it was, it took a while to get, to get rolling. Yeah. Cause if you're going to try to go door to door and explain this, it, it's going to, it's going to be time and labor intensive. Thanks. Okay. Karen, you had something else you wanted to add. Oh, uh, I was just going to say on the table there. Um, I also got a copy of what is called. Yeah. It, it's, um, Something we create, we created also. It's it's a suggested task list, and basically it's a step by step who to call to do what, when you do what to do. It's it's if you're serious about doing it, then they and they contact me. Then this is what I send them, and it just walks you through the whole thing. It tells you who you know who your contact and phone numbers and and everything. Um, but it's specific to our county again. But if if the you know if another county was interested in doing something similar. I just brought it as an example. No, that's great. I mean, I think, yes. and I'll look to Steve um, Ward. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm guessing that um, a document like this, a checklist, would be something that McFack, our Maricopa County Fire Advisory Committee, um, would be very interested in taking a look at, uh, modifying it as necessary for Maricopa County, and then um, making it available to anybody and everybody. So thanks for bringing that. And I can also uh, provide you some more documentation. So we do it a little differently. We actually go to the communities, having a community meeting like this in each of our communities and go through a mildly lengthy, long presentation that includes the whole risk assessment process. And so we actually inform all the community members step-by-step step through what we have as an individual risk assessment form. So they self-assess. And if they are unavailable or can don't feel comfortable to do that, we are available to come out and do that ourselves as well. But we found that it's easier because you guys are doing it yourselves for you folks to self-assess and to also see to understand the real risks of what are going on in your home. So you know what a type A roof is or a non-vulnerable siding is. And so we try and provide that information that let you guys come back and do that. And if help is needed, then we also mm -hmm. provide that as well. Great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Some of us have the county line going through our property, so it's both counties. <laughs> and what I've found more recently than historically is each county says, no, go to the other county. No, go to the other county, go to the other county. And a ping pong ball, even the Nixle warnings, I don't get either because each county is saying, how do I address that? <laughs> well, um, it stops here. <laughs> and and I guess what I'll say, I was sort of mouthing um, Swift, yeah, to, um, to Chief Ward. So exactly what you were talking about years ago, 10, 20 years ago, I think it was, um, there was an acknowledgement that there was a hole between Tuolumne County and Mariposa mm -hmm. County, and that hole was pretty much right in your area. So, forty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I that I can't go back that far, but what I can tell you is that 
um, Maricosa County and Tuolumne County came together and they created what's called the Southwest Interface Team. And that has folks from CAL FIRE, Steve Ward goes as the representative from County FIRE. Um, there are folks from Tuol the Tuolumne CAL FIRE unit that I don't remember what all the alphabet soup is over there. Um, you know, there are folks from BLM, there are folks from Forest Service. So everybody comes together and talks about how do we reduce wildfire risk in this area, um, the south, uh, so southwestern Tuolumne, northwestern um, Mariposa County. So I think somewhere between Mariposa County Fire Advisory Committee and the SWIFT group, um, we will make sure that um, folks are um, acknowledged for being where you are. Does that work? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Other questions? Sorry. Rosemary, can I add something? Yes, I please. wanted to add that um, I, I know Chief Ward's coming up next. I also, um, there was lots of documentation that I could use. So Yosemite West has a um, community wildfire protection plan, the CWPP, and so does the county, which I know you're, I think you're going to get to. Um, I combed through that for information and risk assessments and things like that. There's lots of documentation you can find of Fire professionals have assessed your area probably at some time, and you can you can use that towards your uh, towards your risk assessment, your action plan as well. Yeah, she's she's right. There's a lot of information, and for those of you who have not made time to look at our um, Mariposa County Wildfire Protection Plan (CWPP), um, that's an important place to start because uh, the folks who worked on that plan made a deliberate effort to pull in all of the different plans. Um, when I first became a supervisor, I was sort of pulling my hair out because there's a state level plan and then there's the, um, the, uh, the unit plan, the MMU. So in our area or the Tuolumne counterpart, they all had their own plans for their area. And then the county had its plan and each some of our communities had their own plan and they were not connected together. And then of course there are our federal partners, right? So Yosemite National Park has its plan, Forest Service has their plan um, and they were not talking to one another. And that is one of the things I'm really proud of in the community, the county wildfire protection plan. We brought all of those plans together and McFack takes a regular look at that to make sure that um, and I'm not overselling McFack, I don't think Steve, <laughs> but you know, they keep very much in mind what are they doing over in the park? What are they doing in the Forest Service? How is that going to affect us as a community as we move forward to reduce our wildfire risk? Now we need to add SWIFT to, to the mix. But yeah, we they're will make sure. Of, they're part of SWIFT. They're, they're part of the county. Great. Okay. All right. Other questions on how to move forward with um, FireWise recognition? We've got folks here who have a lot of experience. You said 16 and how many, Joe? 13, so 29 communities that have been, and, and a dark, so 30 communities that have become firewise recognized. <clears throat> what other information would be helpful? Yes, sir. Hi there, my name's Brandon. Um, relatively new to the community, but we're really invested in, uh, you know, I'm a restaurant owner out here and putting forth back into the community. Now, as far as red tape, um, you know, uh, community outreach, uh, phone and, you know, cleaning like road encroachments or something like that. How are you overcoming any hardships or, or what type of liability issues have you encountered in the past and how maybe you have overcome them? Like, mostly what, what they're doing is roadside clearance type stuff you know, brushing along the, the edges. Um, pretty much if they're 10 feet on, on either side of the road, it's, it's pretty usually covered under the, the county or the subdivision and we don't have any issues. We haven't had any issues that have arisen. Um, and they're generally not falling trees in that 10 foot zone, they're brushing and limbing mostly, uh, getting all that small stuff out of there. Um, so, you know, you still have to follow the laws and rules and all mm -hmm. that good stuff. And, you know, if it's an HOA, um, 
you coordinate, you call them, you know, let them know what you want to do, you know, make a partnership out of it, or whoever the landowner should know that you're, you know, so it, it generally all works out. Everybody wants the same goal, but it hasn't really been a problem for uh, on my side. Yeah, I, I would agree very much, Karen. It um, hasn't been much of a problem with us. Um, Madera County, a lot of the communities are on roads that are not county maintained, and so obviously that negates any of that issue with liability there so everybody works together um and when we have been on county maintained roads we've just discussed it with the county and made sure that we had been clearance to do so and we've never ran into any, any problems there whatsoever so so just uh clear communication is key. just clear communication yeah and once you have that firewise community it gives you that much more access to your other fire experts so you have that that voice to be able to speak to your fire safe council and rcds and cal fire because you have that that connection so Thank you. My name is Joe Mingham. I'm a new member of this community, also been here about three years. Uh, retired firefighter from Modesto for 33 years. Um, what I found out, I also belong to the Mariposa Fire Safe Council and work with Barbara Cohn. Um, I'm the only representative to the north end of the county. Um, and I woke up the other morning and this is my problem. Uh, Did you wake up? <laughs> <laughs> waking up is a good thing. I didn't wake up dead. That's the important part. Um, but I checked my checkbook, make sure that the house payment had gone through, which I do every third day of the month. And my house payment went up $840. And so I panicked and I called again. The broker said, well, the reason that the insurance, the reason that this went up is because your fire insurance just increased 500%. Now, that, that's difficult for people to maintain. Now, I know working with Mariposa Fire State Council and Cal Fire and the Forest Service and Mariposa and, and all of them, uh, we're doing a lot of work, you know, cutting shipping, brushing, and Barbara comes wonderful the way that she's getting these uh, monies available, these grants. So is there a way, I guess my question is, is there a way that we can project to these insurance companies the amount of work that we're doing and have something taken care of? Because I just happened to find an insurance company that I was on the phone with all day and met all day yesterday that worked. Yeah, I, let me just say that there are no, there are no, there are no magic bullets here. Um, this is something that I've been working on since at least 2016. I got into office in 2015, but I know that what the cost of wildfire um, risk insurance has been going up considerably. And so I think, Gene, you were talking about the. Um, the new regulation that our state insurance commissioner, Ricardo Lara, ha has actually put into effect, I think that was about two weeks ago. Um, and that one, the, the whole purpose of that is to, um, to essentially insist that insurance companies talk to their policyholders. Um, it used to be, I mean, when I, one of the first ones that I came across, it just almost broke my heart, there was a, um, retired firefighter um, up in Placer County, and he had been disabled um, because of his profession. And he, but he'd been doing lots and lots of work on his property and, um, and they canceled his insurance. And he went back and he said, why? And they came back and they said, well, it's because the limbs on your trees are closer than 10 feet apart. And you know, he's a trained firefighter and he's going, where, where did that come from? What is the basis for that? Um, so it was it was a miserable situation. Now, under this new regulation, the, the deal is that the insurance company may say, you know, you need to do X or Y in order for us to insure you. Um, but at least what they tell you will have some basis on, it, you know, coming out of CAL FIRE's experience. And um, there's another organization called the Insurance Institute for Building and Home Safety that does a lot of research into wildfires and, and what, what causes homes to burn down. Um, so it's bringing in information from experts 
And those then become the standards. They cannot just say, well, your limbs are too close together and so we're canceling your insurance. So it's promoting that conversation between the insurance companies and the policyholders. And in addition, under this regulation, if they're supposed to tell you, they are required to tell you what your score is, what your risk score is. And if you don't, if they give you a score of 530 and you say, I don't believe it, then you have a right to appeal it past the insurance company into the Department of Insurance. So there, <laughs> we've been pushing hard, a lot of us, um, to, to come to this point. There are no magic bullets. It's going to take time to make this work, um, but at least there is a path forward. I was basically told that next year I will be dropped. Hmm. Then I get a hold of an insurance company elsewhere, and they said, no, you're in a perfectly good spot, and we will give you insurance for uh, $1,000 a year versus... Hmm. That is great. I mean, I would love to get your information before you leave, because I'd love to go back to the Department of Insurance and tell them about the story, because they're looking for these kinds of... Well, there's a lot of people like, like you know, yeah. Shannon was saying that you just can't get out and do it. And do they have access to phone and internet and, you know, all this stuff? And, and, and an $800 increase or to be dropped. Is quick. Yeah. And, yeah. Know, yeah. No, I. You got to get the word out there somehow. We we do, and and it's going to require a lot of effort and bringing together a community, as John and Karen have been talking about, and the dog as well. Um, you know, it's because a friend of mine says um, you may not be able to go out and operate the chainsaw, but can you bake brownies? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, Karen. Did you want to add something? Well, I've got a question for you then. My, my understanding was too that also in that bill, what, what it's not a bill, it's um, it's a regulation. Regulation in that regulation that it uh, requires the insurance companies to provide um, a discount incentive um, to properties that have been cleared and um, whatnot. And one of those qualifying categories for firewise communities. Yeah, so so the way that the regulation was finally published, they acknowledge fire what they the state is requiring that they acknowledge firewise communities. How they handle that, I think um, there's some evidence that they're willing to consider reducing the premium that they would otherwise charge. I think that's why I say there's no golden, there's no silver bullet because it's it's sort of I'm gonna charge you four thousand dollars for your insurance, but then I'll give you a discount of five percent. So we need to get so there's another, there's a whole other conversation about the Department of Insurance developing a risk yeah. model. So they can go back to the insurance companies and say, no, 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 no. Karen, Karen's not in that higher risk area. So one more follow-up with that, um, related to firewise communities. Um, what my advice has been to um, um, when 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 one of the one of the things that attracts people to becoming a firewise community was the potential that they might get a, um, a percent off taken off of their their insurance. And they've been running there are some companies that were providing that and they're running around ten percent. I mean it's not a whole lot but it's something. Um, so that's one been one of the incentives so but then it became an issue with some of my communities that well we have this boundary and you know these people are participating and these people aren't why should they be getting a break on their insurance if they're not participating so that became an issue that was being discussed so here's what we came up with <laughs> how, how it's approached when you get your um your, your firewise community gets recognized from the NFPA, you get approved. Um, you will receive a certificate. Your, your leader, it comes to your leader group. They get a certificate and it's dated for one year. That certificate um, becomes your proof of being a firewise community. So what many of them are doing is they are making copies of that certificate and providing it to the members of the community that are participating. And then that's what they provide to their insurance company to show that they are an active member of, of the Firewise community. No certificate, the insurance companies in our county aren't recognized, aren't considering them. Okay. That's okay. how it's happening. 
All right, thank you for that, Karen. Um, I think we need to move on to our next uh, couple speakers. Um, can I assume that um, Adar and Karen and John will be around along with Jean and the other fire, CAL FIRE folks um, to answer specific questions that you may have? Um, but I'd like to move on. And the next presenter is Brian Matos, who is the forester for our Mariposa Merced Madeira CAL FIRE unit. I mean, you. Okay. Good evening. It may come up that to do your firewise work, you need to remove some trees on your property. The California Board of Forestry and Fire Protection has an interest in that if your trees are timber species and if your property is timberland. So if you're going to be cutting up here, typically ponderosa pine, incense cedar, sugar pine, white fir, Douglas fir, or black oak, if those other trees are growing on your property, then the Board of Forestry takes an interest in that. And if you're going to sell, barter, exchange, or trade logs from those trees, or if you're going to be converting timberlands into non-timberland use, then that tree cutting must be done by a licensed timber operator. There are also several different kinds of timber harvest documents that the state will require. And if you're going to be doing certain practices that the board has recognized are not likely to result in environmental degradation, then they have exemptions to a timber harvest plan. So typically most people are going to use an exemption that is uh, say around your structure, less than 150 feet from your structure. You can remove trees without a registered professional forester, just a licensed timber operator can help you write and file that document and remove those trees. And also if you've got dead trees on your property or you're going to be cutting Christmas trees, um, might as well do your thinning at Christmas season, right? And sell those trees or give them to the Boy Scouts or something like that. So if you're going to be cutting less than 10% of the volume per acre on your property and it's timber on timber land, you can also get an exemption that your licensed timber operator can help you with. Um, that is all I had as a warm up for Chief Ward. Okay. In, in a neighborhood, in their lot, they have to get a timber. In a neighborhood, in your lot, if it's timber on timberland, you will need a timber harvest document. Private property? What about private property? Well, the only other property is federal property or state property. State property, we have to file a permit with the state to cut trees on state property, and federal property is exempt. But yes, private property is what the Board of Forestry is addressing. Okay. Any other tree questions? Because I'm not in. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. <laughs> forestry, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forestry. I got a forester, so there you go. So, all right. Um, so, once again, my name is Steve Ward. I am uh, the Cal Fire Assistant Chief with, Mar with the Mariposa County um, Mariposa Division, and uh, I oversee the Mariposa County Fire Department as well under agreement. So I am the Mariposa County Fire Chief. I'm also on my other hat, uh, the state uh, assistant chief for Mariposa County, of which, you know, I have, uh, we have battalion chiefs and stations and personnel and specific folks that will come out for uh, specific projects that I can assign to, to help uh, with our community. So one of my charges though, on the county side is as uh, Supervisor Smolcom stated, is the chair of the Mariposa County Fire Advisory Committee. And amongst that uh, direction was given that we are to implement the um, community wide uh, community wildland prevention plan. And so that has been ongoing for the last uh, three years, two years. We approved the board approved it in February of 2021. 2021. Okay, so less than that. So within that, uh, there's there's several steps. And if you look at it online, table nine, there's the whole implementation plan that's being taken by different entities that are part of this group. We talked about uh, members that are part, this is a coordinated committee group. So not just federal and state agencies, but your resource, uh, your fire safety council members are there, your resource conservation district members are there. We got members from public works that can be a part of this. Uh, pretty much any entity you could think of that would be a part of this. Mm -hmm. So from a firewise standpoint, if, uh, community firewise community was having trouble getting hold of a, a county for I don't know an, an easement issue or, or something of that nature. That is something that a firewise or any committee they come to McFadden 
and say, hey, we're, we're having trouble on our fuel break project because of X. And we should have the expertise and the knowledge or the, the people to make those contacts at the table or during that meeting, or if not, be able to invite them to that meeting so we can get issues resolved there and get it all coordinated in one fashion versus, oh, hey, well, we'll get them and we'll try to have them call you back and all that other stuff, right? So we can actually get stuff put together uh, as a committee. We're just an advisory, we're an advisory committee. We're not an oversight board of any type. So that's just it. We, the, the whole point of the committee truly is to make advisories and suggestions to the fire chief and to the board of what is, um, what opportunities for fire prevention and or uh, coordinated fuel breaks and those type of things throughout the whole county. So it's a county level plan. However, within that plan, each of our communities are identified. So currently uh, we're, we're trying to reduce it down because they were initially identified by clusters of structures and there was like 38 different community zones that were identified in our county. And we all know that it's, it's more like 15 uh, true communities as far as named townships. So we, we got it down with boundaries. We're working, getting it down to about 24 to 27 uh, community areas. So um, with that, each of those areas is going to have its own separate appendices that's part of the overall plan. So you have a county plan that talks about the history, the the what the um, uh, I just talked about the, the the history, what has happened within the county over the years, uh, the the uh, statistical data that leads to certain fuel breaks and, and why it's important, and and just some general knowledge countywide, and then it breaks it down into um, communities themselves. The communities and themselves, dependencies truly are where the community members get involved. So it's unrealistic for um, any, it's unrealistic to go around to each community and go through and do an in-depth service or an in-depth um, um, review within, within their areas. So no different than the FireWise, which we're trying to integrate into this. FireWise is all about your smaller communities, right? Your community groups within an area. So just for an example, let's say that everybody on Fisk Road here, they, they decided to be their own community group. You're making your own football team. This is the team that's gonna work. That's what they're doing, right? So that part is built in uh, as part of the overall community effort. So where, where that ties into the CWPP is versus asking our community members, because we'd be looking for the same thing, is who in the community is involved or interested enough or would be willing to do an assessment on their community. And that comes back and that overall assessment goes into the overall plan, which then McFack looks at all the communities, the recommendations for fuel breaks, the recommendations for, you know, that, hey, this road's overgrown for the last four years. This ridge needs to, you know, in our assessment, this ridge needs to be opened up based off of uh, statistical data, which Cal Fire and the county are, will be able to provide you. So those type of things would come back from that assessment back to the McFack group and we can look at that because your, your assessments as community members fits within the overall plan of the county. So it's a community-wide prevention plan that's truly built on our community members assisting with the assessments and understanding their communities and their hazards within their area. The firewise portion of this is breaking that down even further to where there's actually action going to be taking amongst these residents. The community is has these, these hazards. However, within that community, these residents are taking actions amongst themselves through their properties to create a fuel break and, and reduce that hazard. And that can be recognized within the, within the plans. So rather than saying, hey, here's a firewise plan. Oh, and by the way, will you do a community plan? And then you know what? Can you do a plan about this and a plan about that? What we're trying to do is break it down into one appendices. So that way the firewise assessment is built into that appendices. So as the community group just does their assessment of that community, anybody that wants to be firewise, a group of, of homes or, or a community group wants to be firewise, they can take their boundary and they can use that firewise assessment that's built into the appendices to qualify for that as well, because it's the actual firewise assessment that we want to build into it. So one would be the home hardening firewise assessment, and the other portion of that appendices would be the environment around you. 
So there's lots of statistical data that you'd be looking at that appendices going, man, how the heck do I know that? Well, that's where I come in. So those are the phone calls that you make back to the county fire department or, or to the McFat chair, whoever that person would be. And we have the links and the ability to say, okay, what area are you talking about? We can give you that statistical data through this, what they use as no harm is, um, it's almost like a um, fire running data or a, or a projection data to give you statistical information that you can put into your plan for your area. Just not tree questions. Just not tree questions. <laughs> and not even that either. That's a computer telling me that, man. I mean, <laughs> but what I would do is actually tie you in with those folks. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at, uh, if you're, because this is a ground up model for FireWise, if you had, uh, say, 20, 20 residences, 20 homes that wanted to build their own little community, and you wanted to create that border, you needed some help GIS-wise to be able to submit that, I can help you with that. Um, Captain O'Neill will be able to help you with that. We can work through our local GIS to get you those type of, that kind of data. So those type of things. When you're looking at assessments and it's talking about tree densities and talking about uh, flame lengths and it's talking about spread rates and you're like, how the heck? I don't know. Well, that's, that's stuff that we can get you. That's stuff that we can say, tell us what area you're talking about. We'll look at it. We'll get that stuff punched in. We'll give you a run model. You know, get all the information that that will go in there. In fact, what I'll probably say is fill out everything you can. Give me the stuff you can't. We'll get it, put it in there for you, and get it back to you, so you can go back to your community group and, and make sure that that's the way you want it. And then you can turn it in. So those are the that's the support that we'll be able to give you as you develop and decide who's gonna who's gonna do this. Right. So again, it's a bottom up. It's not a top down. The CWPP is a county. The county has done their their plan or their portion of it. And now we're going to start reaching out to our different community groups for their portion um, and their buy in and their their engagement for um, their assessment of their communities, because nobody knows their communities better than you. You're the ones that drive through it every day. You're the ones that look at it. You're the ones that know the fire history. I mean, we know fire history on the map. You know fire history because we're there, but you also know, you understand fire history from your families. You've seen it before. You know, you the fire didn't come from this direction, but you know that it ever came from that direction. This is what will happen because that's what Great Oak or whatever said. You know, family members or just knowledge of your land. You know that that's what that's the that is the threat. So those are the type of things to that assessment that you can come back to McFack and say, hey. We believe that this is something that needs to be done. Um, we're going to do it through our FireWise community, or can you help us work with our local fire safe councils, our RCDs? You know, these are folks that maybe you can help coordinate some kind of a fuel break project in here and give us ideas on how to do that. And so, from a county's perspective, that can be coordinated in and planned out. So, you can say, you will know they're already doing one here. We'll just tie into that and bring it back through this way, and this is how we'll do it. So, it's just a way to coordinate everything all together. It all comes back to our community uh, community members, and it just takes those couple of people to get it going. So I'll leave it from the bottom up. So that's the that's the spiel. On <laughs> so thank you, Steve. Uh, this is this is where I think um, the rubber really meets the road because you guys, as Steve said, you know what's going on in your communities. You know what's burned and didn't burn. Um, in the last fire. And we really need to tie all of those pieces together. And it is through our county wildfire protection plan and the next level up, the MMU strategic plan, that we see that broader picture across um, not only Mariposa County, but the counties in our neighborhood, at least those three counties. Um, so they will be part of your conversation as you think about, all right, my house is here and my neighbors are right around me. And now what's going to happen over here on, let's say, Forest Service land or on that ridge over there that we know hasn't burned in 20 years and we know it's going to go. Um, so those will, they, they will be open to having those conversations with you because they've already thought about it, that ridge. I can guarantee you. Yes. I just had one last question. It's for you folks in uh, Adar, is that her name? Um, so when you guys decided to do this in your community, what did you find that you did that was successful? 
and not so successful in engaging and, and explaining and getting the participation from the community? How did you do it? What what worked and what didn't? That's, um, a, little, that's a little bit difficult because Yosemite West actually has a very long history of fire prevention. So I kind of joined just the, the conversation that was already going and added a component. So um, I mean, like I, the, the mailings for asking for feedback for um, the amount of hours and money spent, that was not successful. The online form was much more successful. People like to click a link and provide information that way. But as far as like getting the message out, you know, we just kind of used our existing channels and there is a lot of discussion about fire in our community. I've, if I was starting from scratch, it would be, I think it would be, it would be interesting and difficult. It'd be a challenge to get the word out and define the boundaries if we didn't have such clear boundaries and get, get the ball rolling. And once the ball is rolling and once you start talking to people who are excited with you and who can help you, other people can help you, everything will just move along smoothly. But yeah, it, it is a challenge getting it started. You really need someone who is motivated and willing to send a lot of emails and make phone calls and try to get things going till you get connected with the right people. I'm glad that now this has started because when I started, there was we there were there were no firewise sites in Mariposa County and it wasn't really a thing that people were doing. And so it took a while to get the ball rolling. I think if people want to start now, they have more people they can start contacting, like me, myself. I can put my email in the in the chat, but I think there's more people you can start contacting who can give you advice about like, okay, well, if you want to try this, if that doesn't work, try this, you know, that, that kind of thing. But um, I just want to encourage people to do it because uh, like I said, I'm not a fire professional. I've learned a lot along the way. Now when we go on vacation, I'm kind of annoying my husband because I'll look at houses and I'll be like, oh, do you see that roof type or look at their gutters or look at this. Yeah, I see all the fire hazards now when we travel because I've been trained to, but that's, I mean, that's kind of the point is to train people in your community to identify those hazards and understand what is on their own properties they can fix. So yeah, but let me, um, let me uh, put my email in the chat, but I, it would be helpful if we had, uh, if someone could compile a list of uh, resources that people could start with, like the, the, the CWPP, the Mariposa County one, things like that, so that we could, people could get started and have some resources from the start. So I'm sorry if I didn't answer your question. That was a bit of a ramble, but that was all the things I was thinking about as I was listening to people talk. Thank you, Adar. John, and then Karen, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, sure. So can for, I just make a recommendation to yeah. maybe be cognizant of using acronyms that people don't know what they are? No problem. Yeah, no, I, I definitely understand that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so like Adar, I'm not a fire professional either. I was a carpenter for 20 years. So I know homes. And so therefore the home hardening kind of came second nature from that. But really it's about using whatever you find. So I'm sure you know a handful of your neighbors. And if you could speak to those neighbors, they know a handful and it's that exponential growth thing, right? And so if you can connect with a few folks that are around you, however, the size that you want to create. So whether it be a road or a whole subdivision, but just reach out to those few folks. And then for us, it's been community meetings. It's been this versus trying to send out constant mailers or to recreate that. It's getting everybody together on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, somebody bringing some cookies along and myself, or the Cal Fire Defensible Space Inspectors, we work closely with them as well. We come and we speak with everybody and just talk with them because like I mentioned before, I'm in my little bit, a lot of us in mountain folks kind of want to be our own little island, you know, and they don't, we don't want to interact with everybody or if we do, we only want to do it so much. And so I, I really find getting everybody back to that community level again and just getting a little meeting going and everybody exchanging phone numbers and everybody go, oh, you live in that house that has that problem or, oh, you live, the, what about that vacant lot down there? And just getting these ideas together and also utilizing the um, expertise that you have in your own community. How many of us up here have retired firefighters in our community? Carpenters, people that know something about these issues that we're, we're discussing right now. And those folks are usually the ones that want to share their knowledge a little bit. And a lot of times those are the folks that actually reach out first and are become our, our resident leaders as well. And so I really think it's just getting together for a cup of coffee or burning a burn pile and grabbing a beer, whatever your fancy is. But I really think that community level thing is, is what gets folks together more so than additional pamphlets in the mail or those type of things that we just look at once and 
sent to the circular file. So get together, talk. That's what we need to do. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just say that I think every community is going to be different. I think about the communities in District 1, which is the one I serve, and um, the Foresta Preservation Association up in the Foresta area, they have a board that's already been created. They've identified a couple people that are going to be working on firewise recognition. Um, they already are working with the Park Service on what they call Whopper Fest which is once a year they all get together and they clean up the limbs and all that stuff. So they're ready to go. Other communities in my district, it's going to be a lot like herding cats, but I think it's it's showing up at the different community meetings. It's showing up at when South, when the taco truck comes around and folks come and you know chat um, about what's going on in their neighborhood. You know, we'll need to insert ourselves into those conversations and um, and basically, they'll they'll know what's um, what the issues are. I'm sure you all know directly what the issues are in your community. It's but the, what I have found, I don't know that it's true here, but what I found is it's like, well, so what can I do? What can I do? I mean, I've cleared around my house, but I still worry about the fire risk in my area. So this is where Firewise comes in with the connection to McFack and our uh, County Wildfire Protection Plan. And we'll help you pull those pieces together. So that's my plan in my district. And I'm guessing that that's, it, it's the way that each of us is gonna have to look at it. How, what, what can you build on in your community? You know, do, does, every, do everybody go, does everybody go to three or four churches in the area, for example? Show up at a church meeting. We all go out and have coffee afterwards. So talk about fire instead of, <laughs> what the sermon was like <laughs> anyway so um it's going to be different by community but it's people talking to people i think we have challenge them and the door so other questions i want to be respectful of people's time um it is um 7 13 but if you guys want to ask some more questions i think we're all happy to um, stay here and answer so i've got one fellow that's had his hand, and then we got a couple more. So let's. Sure. Sorry to go back to the trees. I just kind of wanted a clarification on that. Because, um, to my understanding, with commercial logs, commercial timber, is there like a DBH limit? Because you know, when you're driving around the Grilly Hill area, for instance, ladder fuels are a big problem. There's a lot of small trees, little trees, you know, whether it be pine, sugar pine or the, the other species you noted. So that's a big problem, or the ladder fuels, the biomass. So are those considered commercial? Because I wouldn't think they would be. So the test is on you if you're going to sell, barter, trade, or exchange. So if you're just having people mass, if it's going in a chipper, if it's going in a burn pile, if you are going to lop it in place, then it's not sold, barter, trade, or exchange. Okay. Uh, okay. Mm, yeah. Or firewood in your own stove. So is there a DBH that's considered once you go say above 12 inch and size okay. does not matter to the board. Okay. All right. So if you're using it, if you use it up for firewood, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, or if you're selling your live oak and yeah. burning your own black oak. Sell trader barter. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. That's a big one. Okay. okay. Yes. Yes. Hello, <laughs> my name is Dan, and I'm thinking that we're all here because we're, we're interested. We want to move forward with this. So I think if we could get a list of our resources and form a committee and get going on this, I think that would be the, because it seems like uh, it all seems pretty overwhelming, but it really isn't. It's just, and I like the idea of bottom up. You know, it's just we can start with a few and uh, grow from there. And a, a start is the most important. And uh, and actually, uh, I'll just say uh, I I found out about Firewise from the Not So Fair plan. And <laughs> if you read your some uh, of uh, your not so fair plan information, they do recognize a 10% discount. But 
you know, that's uh, that's pay really in there. You know, and, a lot of us are with that. So that's uh, I think before we leave tonight, we can have a list of folks and phone numbers that are interested in it, and then also uh, a list and name of our uh, the resources, the resource people that are going to help us pull this off. Which um, there we go, and we got <laughs> Kyle. What? He's, oh, he's going to help us out. But uh, so um, do you sounds want, like we're all going to learn together. So do you want to repeat? You're looking for name, address, phone number, email, if you've got one. Yeah, I'm hearing impaired, and I can't read. Oh, okay. I have to ask again. What all do you want on the list? I, I think just a, a, a name and a phone number, a uh, an email. I'm not a big email person, but uh, name, phone number, email. I think so. Just a, a point of contact. That's a good place to start. That's good. Yeah. That's perfect. So, and then it does look like number one is you know, let's get going. Let's organize it. Yep, form a committee. Number two is the plan, creating a uh, vision wildfire risk assessment, which is here. <laughs> we got this, and then it, 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 it's, uh, it is self explanatory, but uh, needs, uh, we need guidance. So, like what I got to say, let's get started. All in favor of nominating Dan as the chair. <laughs> well, it, that's why I actually came here is because I did start. You look at a far wise community and you look at Greeley Hill. Um, I did start a, uh, you know, I think it, it might even pop up, but uh, I think, you know, I just, uh, and it's a team effort. Yes. And so that's why I'm here because I didn't want to go it alone. And I think if we share uh, our, uh, you know, share every, the, the work to get this off the ground, um, and there's plenty of folks here that are willing to guide us, I think this would be a great thing. Dan, what's the name of your district? Uh, I don't have, I, don't do Facebook. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said you created. No. Oh, well, it, it's a. I, I logged into the the Firewise site or the oh, NFPA. You logged into the portal you and started the an app. Firewise USA. Correct. Yeah, uh, you started the. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, with another question. Would you mind? Yeah, people on the phone. Do we, uh, how do you establish your, your boundaries? I mean, you have boundaries in Palm County. How do so, you so is, it, you, you when you have your first meeting, you, you need to figure out where your boundaries are. Yeah. You, look, you, you guys know, basically, you get a, you know, a sense of what neighbors would be interested in it. You know, it's kind of, and then you put that on, look at that, and then usually most people end up looking at roads, you know, all these people yeah. along these roads and these roads, and what would make a logical perimeter, and then you define that. You you, you create it. And that's probably priority one, though, is to get your... Um, it, it's helpful, but yeah. you don't have to finalize that until the, until the point you push the button to send your application in, so, you know, get... Draw it and start it at that point, and then do you start your risk assessment? And that risk assessment you would do together with your local fire department representative. You'll work together on that risk assessment, and through that process, you might might make sense to add this area or take this area out from a fire behavior standpoint or topography standpoint or whatever. It might change that boundary, but in the end, you'll know what it is, and you'll get your map done, and you define it. Thank you. So as far as the risk assessment goes, I called Cal Fire and they were great. They came up and they did it on my property. Is that what you're talking about? And no, that's a whole different thing. Because when I did that, then coincidentally, an insurance inspector showed up after 14 years of never showing up. Really? And I was absolutely shocked. I said, well, Cal Fire was here and they said, 
I'm good. And I went into detail. And he looked right at me and said, I don't care what Tau Fighter says. I'm here to look at something else. No. You drew attention to yourself. Yes. No. So as one of the slides that Karen had in her uh, presentation was showing, um, I'm sorry, I'll get over closer to read. That's fine. Oh, okay. Um, is that what CAL FIRE is responsible for, I guess, fundamentally, is the defensible space inspection. So that's the 4291 inspection. Um, the insurance companies, as we were discussing earlier, they sort of have what I call the secret sauce. I mean, because they won't tell you what they're, what they have been unwilling to share information about what their priorities are in terms of what you do around your house. That's why this regulation is so important because now when we get stories where um, they are failing to disclose that information, Department of Insurance can step in. Thank you for going over that again. It's obvious I missed something. I'm not reading fast enough. No, no problem. Yeah, um, read, can you move over to this side? Because that's where the camera is. I'm sorry. Okay, sure. Um, and then I'll turn the <laughs> mic over. I, I just wanted to mention, I, I neglected uh, to introduce Allison Lee Deek. Um, Allison is new to our community. She is um, working under the U University of California Cooperative Extension, Fadzai Mashiri, who is our farm advisor here in uh, Mariposa County, um, has been looking for expertise of the type that Allison brings to the table. And Allison has knowledge of fuels management, fire management, prescribed fire, and what else do you want to add? <laughs> I'll add that I can also talk to post fire management a little bit. And I'm also coordinating the, the prescribed burn association that we have in Mariposa and Madeira and somewhat Merced and Fresno counties. <clears throat> so if you're interested in potentially conducting a prescribed burn on your property or learning more about conducting prescribed burns, um, I'd be the person to talk to. We're a community led group of, of landowners, agency people, and just people that are interested in doing in learning about prescribed burning that will go out to properties and work together to, to implement these. So I will put my information on the, the pad that's going around. Um, a large part of my job is doing community education. So I, if you want information about fuels mitigation, home hardening, defensible space, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to come talk during meetings or, or answer any questions that you have as well. And Allison, you were also a firefighter, am I correct? Yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> So we have a lot of knowledge and experience and a lot of expertise um, available. Yes, sir. I'd just like to ask a question. Is there a minimum size? Is there a minimum size of the property that you would have to have in order to get a prescribed burn? Because I know some of these companies out here that are masticating won't come out and do a one and a half acre lot, uh, you know, 20 acre minimum. You know, I think it would really depend on the property, more of the, the different variables of the property, um, how comfortable you are with risk as a landowner, and how comfortable the people in the first fiber association, the their burn boss, the fire engine, whatever, how, com they, how comfortable they would be with igniting there and leading a burn. Where's the risk? Yeah, yeah, that's a key. And I'll, I'll also mention that um, I think as we as communities start walking down this path, that's where we get into the question of, as, as Karen and John were saying, where do we find the money to be able to support some of these projects? And um, that's where I think of some of the folks who've been mentioned, our Fire State Council, our Resource Conservation District, and then also um, NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, and But that requires, again, I, part of the reason I'm so excited about FireWise is that NRCS um, in the past um, has tended to look for larger properties. I think it was a 20 acre minimum. Um, I don't, they changed their policy during the tree mortality disaster. I don't know quite where it is right now, but um, by with neighbors working together in the firewise context, it gives you the opportunity to seek funding from um, from the Natural Resource Conservation Service um, as a group and do broader scale work in your community. So we can talk more as we move down this path about what where the funding might be um, and how to go about getting it. So I can speak up. Um, 
with the NRCS, it's uh, it's called the EQIP program, EQIP. It's another acronym. I apologize. Environmental Quality Incentives Program, I believe. And they will cover somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty to seventy percent of of fuels reduction of of environmental quality improvement. And so it's it's a program that they will look at the whole property and they will come and depending on what your needs are, they will remove invasive species, they will clean up hazardous trees that are, are fire issues, things of that nature. So you can reach out to your local NRCS office up here, um, or like I said, look up NRCS and look up the EQIP program. Is and it is a match, it's a, it's a, they'll cover cost share that you guys are. So 50 to 70% is what they'll usually cover. And it goes down to one acre right now. They, they used to be larger tracts of land, but they have, have switched it down to as small as one acre. However, the program is very, very overwhelmed right now. So just understand that if you do, if you do try and apply, it's kind of like the lottery. You can't win if you don't play, but just understand that it's going to be a long time process to get that going. Pretty much. That's you know, county kind county. of how, yeah. <laughs> well, then this is federal, so it's a whole extra layer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and um, we're currently without an NRCS district conservationist, but um, John Grimes is standing in. He's the local guy. and um, you know, when you guys are ready, we can make sure that he's available to talk with you. Yes. Sir has a question. Oh, okay. Want to raise your hand? Yes, Sigurd raise his hand. I mean, to unmute. Sigurd, you need to unmute yourself. And I didn't hear that I was up. So uh, going back to the, uh, to the starting up a Firewise community uh, and drawing a boundary. In for us, it's very easy. We know who we are. Uh, then we get to the assessment, uh, risk assessment plan, and I'm curious as to whether all the properties need to be assessed, and if so, how does one deal with non-participating uh, properties within the uh, community boundaries? Yeah, I think that we had a similar question earlier, but Jean, do you want to take a crack at that? Here's the confusion of 4291 versus... So, as we mentioned, this is a volunteer program, okay? So, if... All of us in this room here, if this was one community that was was being formed, but we're missing maybe a dozen folks who just don't want to participate. Um, there's again, what you can do when you're doing the risk assessment is you're just you're just um, an ambassador. You're doing a community outreach. You're knocking on that person's door, and if they say, you know what, I don't want you on my property, I don't want to be part of your risk assessment, move on to the next house. With the national program manager and her words, what she can tell you is <clears throat> as the years go on, just wear that neighbor down. <laughs> show them the work that you do and show them the positive side of things. Keep inviting them, wear them down. And she says, you'll, you'll start to change some minds. It's not 100%, right? Human nature's like that, but um, you just keep keep on. Can you draw a boundary with a donut hole in the middle? <laughs> No. Understand the strategy, uh, but I've been working too much with attorneys to uh, to uh, have the you can get them all on board over time. Uh, so the question can be rephrased as: Should I gerrymander my community thoroughly, and so that I only include the people who wants to be included, and we just ignore the rest of them, or can I formally? Is it within the Firewise program allowed to have community members who simply aren't participating and Therefore, we'll be excluded from any serious risk. I think, I th I think if, if I'm understanding your question, you're, it's like if you have a boundary and you have various parcels in there, and there's a, a, several parcels that don't want to participate, and you're asking whether you need to somehow formally not include them. Is that what you're asking? Well, what I'm asking is, am I obliged to do the risk assessment for every property within the boundary? The easy, easiest for me would be the boundary includes all properties in our community. The risk assessment varies in detail depending on whether a particular property is participating or not. And I expect, Adar, you must have had that kind of situation in your case. Okay, um, you're doing the risk assessment on the area in the total boundary. And you're not doing a house to house risk assessment. You're not you're not looking at each house and saying, 
are they in full compliance with 4291? That, that's like an inspection of each house. And that's not what you're trying to do. You're, you're looking, uh, you, you, you could just drive down the road and, and know if they have a composite roof or if they have a shingle roof. You know, you're gonna, your, your risk assessment is gonna say something like 70% of the properties in, our, in this area have composite roofs. And it's not gonna, it doesn't identify which ones. So it's a generalized sort of assessment. It's not an individual house to house type thing. Oh, good. That that works for us. No problem okay. then. So Adar, Adar is Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I just I wanted to say the same thing that it's community wide. So I would just draw the boundaries where it makes sense because you, this is you're doing it as a community. You're going to burn as a community or not, right? So you want to include everyone in a, a way that makes sense. And if I can see your house, you're in my risk assessment, whether you want it to be or not. If you're in my community and I can see your house, I can look and see your roof type and things like that. And those people, you, you bring them in, you hope that later, even if they're not active participants, you hope that later you can get them on board. And you're even if you just end up protecting the houses on either side of them, you're, they're in your firehouse community. You're, it's about making the whole community safer. So the risk assessment is very much uh, a community overview. So what percent of houses have this kind of roof? What percent of houses have open vents? You know, things like that. So um, don't worry about getting everyone on board. Draw the lines in a way that makes sense and do the assessment on everybody and just hope that later you can get them to be a more active participant in the firewise community thank you that was very helpful well, thank you that is okay other questions we've gone over by quite a bit but um, hopefully we have provided information that is helpful um, as i mentioned earlier i think our speakers or panelists will be available for individual questions if you want um, and I guess I'll step back and say that um, as a first first step, uh, my husband will be I'll be looking to him to put this uh, meeting on the county website. So you folks can go back and review it. Um, ideally, we'll we'll make sure that the presentation material is available so you can see what um, what was included in the slides. Um, and we will also make sure that you have contact information for everybody that's spoken here today, um, along with Allison and John Grimes at NRCS. We'll put together that information. And then what I would ask you, um, my, my contact information is on the Maricopa County website on Rosemary Smallcomb again. Um, reach out to me, uh, and then if you have um, suggestions as to how we can amplify or increase the kinds of information that would be most helpful to you, um, then if we don't have it already, then I'll work with Steve and Jean and other folks um, to make sure that it's available to, to you and to other members of the Mariposa communities that will be um, looking at pursuing FireWise recognition status. So um, beyond that, um, I, you know, I hope Dan will um, step forward and get a, a distribution list going in, um, in in the Greeley Hill area. I'm hoping that other community members, I know Sigurd is in Foresta and he and um, Maggie, um, Maggie Martin, sorry, long day, um, that they're going to be working on pulling together this kind of information for Foresta. So part of what we'll do is we'll exchange information about who's working in which communities so that you can contact people like Adar who've gone through the process and ask them questions, as well as asking people like Allison and Steve and um, me for what little bit I know about fire wise stuff. <laughs> All right. Anything, any last words, questions, suggestions? Yes, Dan. Um, I would just like to, uh, would like to include the, uh, the Zoom folks, um, somehow get their information on uh, our list of people that are interested. Can you capture the list of attendees? Probably. Good you suggestion. Want to, you, want, you won't have it. That's okay. We can find people. <laughs> <laughs> I know Sigurd, for example, and I know Adar is on there. Even so, an email in the chat is the reason. Even e or an email in the chat if the Zoom folks. We have 16. I think we have more than that online. 
So that would be 10, but I can get that. Okay. okay. All right. Great. And if people on the Zoom call want to include their email addresses, that would be very helpful. And we'll try to get a conversation going in the digital world as well as the one here. So if there are no final questions, I just want to thank everybody. I know it's been a long evening. Um, I hope that we have provided the kind of information that will um, encourage you to pursue FireWise recognition and um, that we have acquainted you with enough resources that you feel like you won't be on your own. And um, please reach out to us if we can help in any way at all, because that's what we're here for. So with that, Thank good you. night, everyone. Travel safely.